afternoon, everyone. Thanks for being here. So, like she explained, I'm going to tell you about particip participative crypto economics and the future of universal income. My name is Rajesh Lagari. I'm head of research of the social economy program at Ibre in Sao Paulo. But I want to tell you about a project that is taking place in Mexico City. Quick background, I'm from Lahore, Pakistan, and I studied sociology at the South Asian University in New Delhi. There I focused on local currency-less trade systems as they exist in the Dalit caste, which most Indians still consider to be untouchables. I started working at Ibre in 2010 and was uh, about two years ago approached by CDRMX. CDRMX is a collaboration project between uh, Mexico City's think tank LabCDMX and SpaceX. Uh, you haven't heard much about it because we were under a very strict NDA until just a few months ago. It's a project focusing on the problems of Mexico City. A city built on a dried up lake bed, yet critically lacking drinking water while sinking into its own aquifer. It is one of the most polluted urban areas on the planet. It is, as if that was not enough, surrounded by active volcanoes and regularly suffering from earthquakes. Some of you may have come across this tweet um, from the director um, of the uh, water management department from the city with a saying that Elon Musk would know what to do, and Elon Musk replied, yup. This uh, seemed to have died short. Uh, in fact, it didn't. It was simply one of SpaceX's best kept secret. We've been working for a year and a half on a very ambitious relocation project, merging rapid architecture and social engineering, based on the plans of Mexican architect Alberto Calac to relocate residents away from the lake bed and onto the hillsides which uh, more and more people consider now to be the only realistic way to preserve the local ecosystem, to reclaim the lake, and in a way to, uh, for Mexico City to keep existing in the future. We were facing two challenges for this. The first, to quickly build sustainable housing, and the second, to incentivize residents to, for, for re relocating there. The first part was taken care of by the team of Otto Wawelski, the founder of Bureau for Rapid Architecture who has a very strong experience with 3D printing houses for disaster relief. Together, his team designed a new district called Impresos. But it's not so much about the, dis the districts that is in interesting, but the way they are built. They designed um, what we call the Sprinter, an autonomous machine that can print uh, whole districts in one block, including infrastructures, uh, so roads, water and electric networks, using clay from the original lake bed and reclaimed rubble from the city as aggregates. The housing is seismic proof and can use geothermal activity for heating and power. Now you can start seeing maybe why uh, Musk was so interested in this project. Not only does he get to prototype future urbanism, but also the conditions in Mexico City are in many ways similar to those on Mars. Some of you may know that um, the first settlements on Mars will have to be located close to seismic faults, simply because this is where the hydrogen necessary for atmosphere synthesis can best be sourced. But it also makes sense to autonomously print the entire colony before the first residents even arrive. This is done by the Sprinter, backed by a powerful machine learning algorithm that allows it to adapt to specific terrain conditions. But back to Mexico City, um, the district plan is also entirely entrusted to the machine. This is a conscious decision that we made uh, to counter the, well, the local political corruption, which is still uh, quite present. We wanted to make it so that the machine cannot be bought, not even by us, not even by our team. So the machine is entirely uh, autonomous. This also allows to prototype new modes of distributed democracy. This is something I will uh, discuss a bit later. F to start with, I would like to uh, discuss what is really the core of my team's contribution to the project, no, mentioning La Renta, uh, based on past experiences with relocation, and despite the obvious state of emergency the city is in, we 
identified that providing new housing, no matter how good it is, would not be enough of an incentive. We needed to give something extra for the people to relocate. And because we're in a city with endemic corruption, simply handing it cash is not a good idea. So we decided to imagine La Renta, a new form of compensation based on the model of universal basic income. But to make this happen, we needed also an entire new economic system, and this is where the Mexicoin comes in. Mexicoin is a new cryptocurrency for local use only, which can only be mined for the purpose of distributing La Renta. And before I'm going to explain how it's granted and how it can be spent, I want to indulge into a quick presentation of its architecture. I'll be quick, you can find the white papers online. Um, so I'm guessing most of you now uh, know what the Bitcoin is, um, the blockchain protocol backed uh, cryptocurrency. The blockchain also backs many smart contracts. But uh, as was mentioned earlier, there are many problems related to energy consumption and security even its, in its most uh, recent updates. There exist alternative systems using more fluid ways to reach consensus. The hash graph by world is one of them using gossip about gossip. Uh, so put quickly, nodes looking at each other even in the absence of a transaction and constantly verifying each other. I won't dwell on the technicalities. What is important is it, is a less, it, it takes less energy to confirm transactions, which makes the pro process faster and more secure. We've decided to take this one step further with the hash mesh. The hash mesh uses a volumetric approach, uh, vol volumetric infrastructure. It's ideal for local network and calls for consensus according to a lesser experienced algorithm, giving priority to Leo, the least experienced operator. Um, this makes that recurrently active nodes are denied Leo status and pushed down the priority list. Um, as a result, owning a large number of machines is absolutely useless to exploit Byzantine faults. This makes the whole process even more secure and fair, but it's limited in terms of uh, scale. Um, the Mexicoin in itself is characterized by a time and a location stamp. Also, it is mi its mining is centralized and capped. It is fully trackable, it cannot be bought using other currencies, and it cannot be divided. There is no such thing as a Mexicent. In a way, one could say it exists solely within what Tina Herbert calls a micro-socialist system. Now, with those technicalities out of the way, I want to present to you the whole system, because it's not just about the Mexico or the, tec the, the technological architecture, but the entire ecosystem. So we designed a self-sustaining one with two goals in mind. The primary goal that to ensure everybody gets their allocated income, and a secondary goal that it would benefit the local economy. Um, this is done using three accounts, private accounts, and one public. The first one being La Cuenta. La Cuenta is the first of the three private accounts. It is used to grant La Renta. So those Mexicoins are deposited there at the beginning of the month, 1,500 Mexicoins for adults, 1,000 for children, no exceptions. Within our economic model, it is more than enough to live very comfortably. La Cuenta is the current account used for daily transactions, but it has something very important and very, very unique. It is fully devaluing, which means at the end of the month, it empties. It goes back to zero before being refilled. And whatever Mexicoins were left on La Cuenta fall back to Los Ahorros. Los Ahorros is the savings account, the little piggy up here. And it operates in two different ways based on the Mexicoin timestamp. It devaluates all coins deposited after March 1st by 20% each month, which is pretty strong. Uh, but it keeps all previously deposited funds whole. For the children, the missing 500 Mexicoins are also deposited there with a special timestamp, locking them until they turn 18. Those funds are not devalued. The goal of the devaluation is to discourage capitalizing, uh, so that unused Mexicoins will rather be injected in a local participative economy powered by Los Proyectos. Los Proyectos is really the core of the participative economy model. You may think of it as an incentivized Kickstarter, allowing residents to invest their spare Mexicoins in projects from other residents in return for goods or services, but never money, making their life either cheaper, more comfortable, more fun, 
I'll give you an example. I'm a small spender. Most of my um, expenses in terms of entertainment is going to the movies. So it would make sense for me to invest in a local cinema that will grant me a weekly ticket. I will therefore spend less of my Mexi coins and I will be able to invest more. This sparks a virtuous feedback loop which incentivizes the flow of capital, allowing to fund quality schooling, retirement homes, local community gardens, sports and culture events, collective gifts, why not, security services, you name it. We're getting one step closer to the idea of distributed politics in the sense that public projects are voted for through participative economy. If a project is not funded in time, it means it's not a priority. It is therefore cancelled and the funds allocated fall back on the contributors a horos and they where they will be devalued until March. Important point is the Mexico coins lost to devaluing they don't just disappear, they're gathered on a collective account called El Taro, the jar here. El Taro is used by public services to cover functioning costs. We estimate that 7.8% of all produced Mexicans will eventually fall on El Taro. Add to this the low infrastructure, infrastructural costs of printed districts and the injection of private funds in local services and all, you get all basic maintenance expenses covered with some to spare which also acts as a buffer, allowing the machine to autonomously keep inflation under control. Now I want to tell you about a few case studies. First one is our investor. Our investor is someone who, well, who's caref careful with their, with their investing and most of their projects do succeed. Giving out perks, a weekly fruit basket or monthly theater ticket, whatever. Um, it reduces spending and allows to invest more. Um, as you can see here, there's only one failure in August where the green project, the second green project, um, stops and all of the money invested falls on um, Los Ahorros in red where they will be um, devalued monthly by 20% and um, go to El Taro, which is here in pink, slash purple. There's a spike in spending in December, that's Christmas, which means less investment on the blue project, and there is a sort of logical decision to save everything in February before the locking of the Los Ahorros, because this will not be devalued. Now, investor in one year has saved half a renta, invested three, and contributed 2.7% to El Taro. Now let's look at another case, that of the spender. A spender is someone who lives like a king, sp spends almost all of his money, letting only 200 Mexicans a month fall to ahorros. They invest nothing, but they're saving, and the savings top at the one year at one third of a renta, while they have contributed to El Taro around 4%. As you can see, this is not the best strategy long term, it's also not the worst. Um, now let's look at the saver. The saver aggressively saves one third of the renta every month. Someone who hasn't really quite understand how it works. At the end of the year, they have saved 2,300 Mexicoins and contributed 3,600, which is over 20% of their original income. This to show that capitalization, while it's ex it exists, it is possible, it is not very interesting, it doesn't yield much. Now, the last example is that of a family, a couple with two children. They start with 5,000 Mexicoins each month because it's of course possible to join accounts. Uh, they invest wisely, they invest in a community garden, they invest in a school fund to get the children to, through school for the, for the year, uh, but they fail to fund a restaurant project, uh, which is the one in blue over here. The investment goes to Los Ahorros, and eventually will devalue to El Taro. And because it's very close to March, they change their strategy and decide to, invo to invest full on uh, because they will not lose so much from devaluation. By the end of the year, they have saved over half of, the, of their combined renta, locked, and contributed 2.14% to El Taro. This shows that Within this system, there exist way to, ways to accumulate money. It's simply they go through different channels. Channels that profit the community as a whole by funding projects. And by now, I hope we all can agree that when the community benefits, so does the individual. The way we like to put it is Mexico eradicates poverty, not wealth. And that's very important for us. But one more thing. The Mexico is a fully digital currency. There is no such thing as paper money. There are no 
payment cards. It relies entirely on biometric encryptions. And payments are secured via fingerprint scan and PIN code. We, for this purpose, every citizen receives a Maxi Wallet, a phone-sized terminal allowing to receive payments, and I insist on receive. It is not something to send payments, so there is absolutely no point in stealing someone else's Maxi Wallet. You will only be able to receive payments for them. Um, Using the Mexi Wallet, one can also check their accounts balance and navigate proyectos, and we're working on allowing people to uh, communicate through the Mexi Wallet using the HashMesh infrastructure. So we're still working on this. This is all using the HashMesh. It's extremely secure, fast, and low energy. Now, I would like to tell you not about our projects anymore, but about two grassroots initiatives that are emerging in the first Impresso, which was which started to be built a little less than a year ago. First one by a, a group called Lab City RMX, which is campaigning to use the hash mesh to implement distributed democracy, a political system relying not on voting, which in some places is seen as easily corrupted or at least influenced, but on a big data analysis of daily patterns, ranging from global consumption habits to autonomously detecting satisfaction levels uh, depending on geolocation. Think of a majority of people show anxiety in a specific place, the machine detects that and invests in a proyecto dedicated to make it uh, safer or nicer. Or different example, people feel happier after the hibiscus bloom, but there is no proyecto to plant more because, well, people feel happier, but they don't necessarily realize that they feel happier because of that. The machine does, though. And the machine will then launch a call for such a project and will fund it using money from El Taro. Now, it's impossible for an artificial intelligence to be elected still pretty much I mean, anywhere. So LabCDRMX are pushing their agenda through a party of dummy candidates who are yielding their public life to the machine. As, and as you can see, their plan is, does not lack humor. Um, now I want to finish with what started as a monthly hacking intervention by a group called Los Cryptos. On the night when the, re the renta falls to zero, um, citizens started competing for a ball that had appeared and was spilling out Mexi coins at a steady rate to whoever holds it for as long as they hold it. As you can imagine, this became a little bit sporty, and the practice eventually evolved into a sort of official discipline called crypto ball. And for readers of The New Yorker, there will be a story about this uh, in the next issue. Um, the the rules are simple. Two teams attempt to hit a flyer as high as possible, and the time it takes a little flyer to come down, the last toucher scores points continuously until the next opponent gets a hit. Um, it became very popular, and there was a successfully funded proyecto um, with which plan to build the first crypto ball arena. So now we're in talks with those people to see how we can uh, make that happen. Uh, and Yes, uh, that's about it. That's uh, all my input on participative crypto economics and the future of universal income. I hope I was clear. I was quite fast, so there is time for questions if you like. And, of, um, and you can, of course, come talk to me after or send me an email at this contact. Thank you. Do we have any questions? Yes, here. Yes, hello. Uh, it was probably because it was so fast that I missed out uh, the information how many people are using that already. So is that now a oh, research um, project? Or it at the moment, it's not so much. At the moment, it's limited to... So the, the first part of, um, of the Impreso is, is built. And we have, uh, if I remember the last census was 283 families, so that's about 600 people at the moment. And what's your strategy then to get it introduced, so to broaden that? Oh, well, we're, we're pitching at the moment, the, the local authorities on the ground are going towards the, the, the citizens. There's a, it's a plan, it's a yearly plan to relocate district by district as much as possible, uh, starting by the most 
critical places because there are places in Mexico City that get flooded very much. And so we go first for those, those areas and then we try to expand it as much as possible. And uh, like I said earlier, the, um, the rubble from, from the, the destroying the buildings on the spot will, can then be used by our printer to uh, build new housing. Any other questions in the audience? That the project was under an NDA. Sorry? Thanks for the talk, firstly. You're welcome. Uh, you said the project was under an NDA. I was wondering if you are allowed to, who is investing in that study? Who is the investor behind your project? Who's, who's investor? Yeah. Well, at the moment, it is really a collaboration between Mexico City and SpaceX in pretty much the same way that Solar City was a collaboration. So the main investor is really SpaceX. I'm not allowed to say more than that at the moment. Even even this information is un uh, since only very just a f just a couple of months we can talk about it. Are there any other questions? Um, don't you think you might incentivize gentrification with that because only the poor are required to have those Mexicoins and uh, the rich can afford to stay in the center in the city center and. Uh, yeah, it will be, they will just focus in the city center. Mm -hmm. This is a very good point. The fact is, those districts will eventually, there, there is a long-term plan to, dis to really destroy those, those districts uh, in, in order to reclaim the lake bed. And this is a ecological imperative. It has to be done, otherwise the city basically suffocates. Um, there's many, I mean, I'm not gonna really go into details of all the problems that arise from uh, living on the lake bed, but people are already f seeing this. And even the most, I mean, in a way, there is some sort of equality there because even the, the, the richest will get their feet in the water at some point. Um, apart from that, yes, there will be a gentrification phenomenon in the districts. We are planning to build very high quality uh, housing and the, what is already built shows that uh, it's extremely comfortable. And so this kind of gentrification we're absolutely pushing for. There will no, not be any poverty. At the moment, we have relocated um, a district which is sort of median income. It's, um, and it works quite well. Uh, we s still need to see how it's going to happen uh, when we start relocating districts with very different incomes. It is true that, it, I mean, this is the point of universal basic income, is you get money no matter who you are for free, uh, but nothing says that you cannot make other money on the side. I mean, you can have your 1,500 Mexicoins at the start of the month and you can still earn pesos or dollars uh, in whichever way you were doing before or in, a, in whichever new way you want to start doing so. So, yeah, this, they, they we're not, I mean, obviously we're realist. We don't, we're not going to annihilate all kind of uh, uh, um, inequality, uh, but we are trying to at least push things a little bit uh, higher so that the, the, most, the most vulnerable will, will get their income and there will not, no longer be poverty. We had yeah. another question, I think, in the very back. Or, or maybe you go first then, because you already have the microphone, sorry. Okay, uh, only short question. Mm -hmm. uh, I don't know the Mexican society in the moment, but uh, other societies I know other than in Germany, I think, they, or perhaps in Germany too, they look for status. They're, they look for status, they yes. They look for status. Mm -hmm. So uh, if people want, uh, if you want to attract something to the people, you have to um, look for a better status. Mm -hmm. How do you track this in your concept? It's actually quite interesting because, uh, well, this is not something we've, we, it's something we've thought about a bit, but we also wanted to be open to, to see what really happened. And in the impreso that we've already relocated, yes, everybody is indeed uh, equal on, on the ground. Everybody gets the same basic income. Uh, but yes, there is still competition and the, the, the crypto ball in a way kind of shows that. Uh, and we start seeing uh, different proyectos uh, uh, emerge that try to be more 
extravagant one than the other, and it seems that this idea of status actually comes, uh, goes now to uh, thinking, designing the most extravagant proyecto and getting it funded somehow. So there is this sort of competition or emulation, call it what you want, but um, it's, uh, it seems to be based mostly on who can create the, mo the weirdest project and get it funded at the moment. It's quite interesting. I mean, as you have seen, the, the crypto ball arena, nobody thought it was going to get funded and it just has passed the limit and it's, yeah, it's quite interesting. Uh, is there any other question? Back here. Um, thank you. That was ultra cool. Um, I have two questions. They're more like of an understanding question. Can uh -huh. you see me at all? Hi. Yeah, I see you. Um, one question is, um, the Mexicoin, is that in any way linked to real-time money? Where did it come from? Is it linked to the economy? How do you get people to accept it? Um, yeah, where does well, the value come from? That's the first question. And the second mm -hmm. question is, did I understand correctly that you have artificial intelligence that suggests, that's kind of like the mayor of the new community that suggests the projects? Or did I, was that just a complete misunderstanding on my part? The, you mean this, the, the grassroots project? Yeah. That's, that's, uh, that's a campaign. It's, it's, de it's there to raise awareness. I'll, I'll, but I'll go back to your first question. It's, um, it's not, no, it's not based on any other uh, currency. It's really an entirely self-sustaining ecosystem. It, uh, so it's completely independent and its inflation is only moderated through, uh, well, by the machine. Um, and to answer the, um, the second question, I, I can show you, I have an extra slide that I can show you, and it's very important to know about this project, is that uh, none of this was true. Um, so this was, this was a, I mean, CDRMX is a fiction. So is Rajesh. I am not an economist. I'm not a sociologist. I'm a designer. I'm part of a design fiction group called Normals. And... Well, we were invited, that part is true, by Lab City MX in uh, Mexico City to hold a lecture and a workshop thinking about the future of the city. And we studied everything that happened in the city and we thought that we would use the format of fiction, like we often do, to sort of sp spark some, some imaginary. What is true? is the diagnosis. The, the diagnosis and the state of ecological emergency, those are true. So are the plans by Aber Alberto Calac. And so our goal was to gather all this in, um, yes, in a fiction that would allow us to stir problems around, to spark that collective imaginary, not necessarily for answers, but for questions, to, uh, to let people try to s look at things from a different angle of what could be. And and so on. And the made-up scenario became the basis for a workshop based on the methodology of future fishing, which is something we uh, came up with. And the grassroots projects I showed you are, in fact, results from the workshop. And uh, I think we have still two minutes, so I'm going to show you uh, a quick video about this. Hi, we're Normals, a design studio exploring the future. You may know us for a made-up language for ultra-fast communications between men and machines, and the nature of digital materials, clothing using personal data as its ever-changing fabric, fictional 3D printable templates of food, shelter, transportation, and books, where we tied all of these to a big single story. Recently, we launched a future fishing training program to make others participate in our fictional net and help them develop their own blurry visions of the future. This is an introduction to our work with the Laboratorio para la Ciudad, Mexico City's very own think tank. Alright, so as must know, Mexico City has been built over a bit late, which is tricky to say the least. Following the vision of Mexican architect Alberto Calach, we based our custom program for the lab on a radical plan to recover the city's lost lake. We researched the subject and finally introduced ourselves as fictional speakers at the lab's public conference, where we portrayed experts in rapid architecture and social economics. 
There, we pretended the city had an undergoing plan branded CDRMX to relocate people in new, treaty printed neighborhoods known as Impresas Populares. Another project was funded by private investors coincidentally seeking to test NT seismic architectural principles meant to be used on Mars colonies. For the people relocating, the incentive lied in the form of universal basic income issued in a new local cryptocurrency named the Mexicoin. Following up on the hysteria and awe sparked by our provocation, we conducted a workshop with the lab and a selected panel. There, we built on top of the pre-established fiction by electing four groups meant to defend their conflicting interests and views on CDRMX. These sparked new ideas such as regenerative floating markets after turning certain avenues into canals, the copy-pasting of homeowners' facades through scanning and printing, a citizen's initiative to make the political class incorruptible by following an AI-centric administration, and more. That will be all for now. Thank you. So, this is... Now, thank you. So this is for real the end of my talk. We are normals and we came up with this future fishing training program, which was the base of the fiction in Mexico City. Uh, you're very welcome. Uh, forget about the other email that was bullshit too. Um, you're very welcome to contact us at sub at normalfuture.re or check the website fftp.normalfuture.re. Um, please write them down because I completely ran out of business cards. Um, and on our website, you can see another little fiction which presents the Future Fishing Institute. It's a little video. And you can then scroll down to find the real thing, which is our serious starter guide of the Future Fishing Training Program, which is something we offer to organizations, public and private, to, well, to acquire a different vision of the future, of their future, and try to make it tangible. Um, that will be all for real. Uh, thank you. <laughs>